All right. So if you're tired of panty waist Christianity, tickle your ear Christianity, storytelling Christianity, all this fluffy, fluffy duff Christianity, then come and join us. Support us and help us grow so that we can take the fight to the enemy. All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Zechariah chapter 10, pray for America's restoration. You know, the word Zechariah itself means the Lord remembers. He doesn't forget his people. He doesn't forget his nation. And that's what Zechariah is all about. He was a prophet during the time of Israel's national and religious restoration. You see, years prior to this, under poor political and religious leadership, Israel went astray. They worshiped false gods, they went into idolatry, you name it. And um, as a punishment, God sent the Assyrians and the Babylonians to conquer or to invade the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And after those uh, invasions, the, the house of Judah and the house of Israel were spread throughout, uh, throughout the countries around that area, and they became slaves. And um, that kind of sounds like America today. We have been... Um, led by corrupt leadership. We've been led by the corrupt establishment for many years now. And, um, and I'm not just talking politically either. I'm talking both politically and religiously. The religious establishment is as corrupt or more corrupt than the political establishment. We've heard a lot and we're seeing a lot of what's going on in the political realm, but we've got to pay attention to what's happening in our churches today as well. They are corrupt, my friends. And they are, I just read an article the, uh, today saying that George Soros was um, infiltrating. If you haven't heard who George Soros is, he's the, he's the billionaire who finances all of these so-called grassroots um, anti-American groups. So the enemy is, has inf is infiltrating our church today, but, but has for many, many years. And it's corrupt. Um, our country is being invaded by people from third world nations um, like Somalia and, and other places who do not like traditional Christian American culture and they're coming here to change it. And that's sort of like what happened to the Israelites back here in history. They were invaded by the pagans. And we're being invaded by pagans today. And back here during this time, they were being restored after this pagan, anti-God uh, revolution that was taking place there. Um, anyways, so this chapter has a lot to do. Though it's talking a lot historically about uh, the nation of Israel, as well as when the gospel would come. But it applies today, I believe to America in many different ways. Let's get reading. Ask you, uh, Zechariah 10 verse 1, Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Now notice there, there was a command. And that command was to ask. Jesus said it in, in one place in the Gospels. He said, ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be given to you. Do you ask God for help? I'm not talking about asking him for a Cadillac or a fancy car. I'm talking about help to further the work of his kingdom or help in your family life to get your family in line, to get the, the chaos out of your personal life. To bring restoration to yourself as your family, your community, and your nation. Have you prayed for that? 
If not, you should. You really need to. And, and, God's, um, and God's pleading with them to, uh, to ask that question. We're going to talk about something here in a second about the phrase, in God we trust. You see, the reason why God wants us to pray here, he wants us to ask, is he wants us to acknowledge that we are dependent upon him. In all things, we can't, we can't live without him. And that's what the symbolism of the rain is all about. Without rain, you have no crops. Without crops, you don't have food. Without food, you do not have life. You've got nothing. So the, the symbolism of the rain here symbolizes that we are dependent upon God for our very existence. And that's why it's so important. That's why God wants us to ask. That's why he says, ask ye the Lord, rain, because it is, it is through him in which all blessings come. And um, that brings up something interesting. You know, our, our nation's motto, in God we trust, is, um, falls in line very well with this verse. In God we trust is a declaration of dependence upon God. Independence from tyranny, but dependence upon God. We rely upon him. We wouldn't have freedom without him. We wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have any blessings. And, um, you know, man, our government cannot provide rain. Gover you can't ask the government, say, hey, you know what? We really need some rain. Can you send a few clouds our way and, and get our crops growing? No, well, it, you know, it works that way. For, you know, government cannot provide. It's God that provides. Government's supposed to just keep law and order according to the word of God. They're not supposed to be doing everything for us. They're not supposed to be redistributing wealth and all these kinds of things. So um, it's important that we, we know where our blessings come from. And it's in God we trust. And one of the reasons I bring that up is because we had um, here recently from uh, some recent good news come out of Princeton, Minnesota here, my hometown. And um, I'm going to read it here. It says, great news from Princeton, Minnesota. With the support of Mayor Paul Whitcomb, the city council voted three to two recently to display America's motto, in God we trust. In the council chambers, Mayor Paul Whitcomb along with council members, now pay attention if you live in our local area here, Jules Zimmer and Jack Edmonds voted to adopt the phrase as the city motto. While council members, now check out these names, Thom Walker and Jeff Reynolds voted against it. Remember these names when it comes time to vote again and support those who honor God and cherish our nation's Christian heritage. In God we trust. Um, and there's the plaque there that they hung up there on the wall in the council chambers. All right. So, hey, that's great that they decided to do that. But what kind of alarmed me, and I'm going to read a little post I posted on Facebook about it, is that Two of the three city councilmen voted against it. Why? In America, especially in a rural town like the one I live in, how could you have two people vote against the very foundation of American government? That is in God we trust. Hey, you know what? We've got to get involved locally in our communities. I've been guilty of it for many years, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of a change to our ministry um, here in a little bit. But I've been guilty of it for many years. You know, um, I pay attention very closely to national politics and, and get involved uh, with that a lot. But I haven't really, you know, when it comes time to vote for the local offices, I'd get to the voting booth and I'd be like, who is that? And I wouldn't know who to choose. Many times I would leave it blank. Because I didn't want to vote for the wrong guy. But then, 
because I didn't do my homework, I didn't pay attention to what was going on in my community, I, I might have missed votes for the right guys. And I've made a pledge to myself that I'm not going to allow that to happen again. Check out your local city, your, your township or your city council. Figure out who's in charge. And, you know, um, support having the motto put up in your community, your town, your county, America's motto in God we trust. Start off with something that simple. All right, it's important that we get involved. And I'm not going to get too heavily into that, talking about that today, but that's going to be, getting involved locally is going to be part of, uh, of Christian Overcomer's mission. Not only are we going to try to model it here in our community, but we're going to try to teach others by example of how to do it in their community. And I'll show you our new model here in a second. But anyways, here's Princeton City Hall, the place where the plaque in God we trust was placed. All right. So I, um, because of these two city council members, voting against and I decided to write a letter to the editor in our local paper called the Princeton Union Times and I'm going to share it real quickly with you um, because it, it'll give you an idea of some things that you can do. All of you probably have local papers and things like that that you can write into. Man, I tell you what, if Christians just got involved and became act active in their communities like we are supposed to, then America um, wouldn't be in the condition that it's in today, all right? We've got to be active, not passive. And we're never too busy. That's the excuse many Christians have. I'm too busy. I got to do this and that. You can't be too busy to worry about your own community. And, I, and I'm chastising myself as well. We can't be too busy to neglect what's going on in our hometowns, all right? It's our Christian duty. All right, here we go. Trust in God or government. This is what I wrote. It's alarming to me that two Princeton, Minnesota city councilmen voted against having the motto in God we trust placed in the council chambers. Why? What are they afraid of? I tell you what, I'm afraid of anyone not wanting those words there. Those words declare that man has to answer to an authority higher than self. That is to say to God. And that's a good thing. All right, one of four here. Dictators, tyrants, and corrupt governments don't want to answer to anyone but themselves. They'd prefer to seat themselves on God's throne, determining for themselves what is right and wrong. So naturally, they despise the words, in God we trust, or one nation under God. It scares them because this acknowledgement limits their power. In 1950, the Florida Supreme Court declared that a people unschooled, now listen closely, a people unschooled in the sovereignty of God, the Ten Commandments, and the ethics of Jesus could never have evolved the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. There is not one solidarity, uh, solid, solitary fundamental principle of our democratic policy that did not stem directly from the basic moral concepts as embodied in the Decalogue and the ethics of Jesus. In such a traditional rural American city like Princeton, it's surprising to me that we've elected two city councilmen that don't embrace the very things that made America great. My friends, it would do us well to heed the warning of President Ronald Reagan when he said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. All right? That's important. It's sad that people would vote against trusting in God when that's what America was built upon. In my own town, supposedly a, Christi or a conservative Christian area. One of the strongholds, if you would, even in Minnesota, yet people have put in, put in power 
People that don't honor God. At least two of them. Three of them are good. The mayor is fantastic. Mayor, we got a great mayor here in Princeton, Minnesota. Um, anyways, I wanted to share that with you to, again to give you an idea of what you can do to be active. Write into your uh, local paper. Go to your city council meetings. Figure out who the good guys and the bad guys are in your community and work to get the bad guys out of there as far as being in a position of power. All right. With that said, our new model for Christian overcomers or our new mission statement, new uh, slogan, Christian overcomers taking America back one county at a time. And as you can see here, the map of America with the Bible, uh, open Bible up to, uh, open up to, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 61. I had it to open up to when Jesus proclaimed the gospel. And right here, is the county I live in, Sherburn County, Minnesota. So that's our goal. We're going to start there. We're going to model it for, for other people. And um, we pray that if you, um, whoops, if you live, if you live nearby uh, Princeton, Minnesota, or in, you know, within a half hour or so, um, I encourage you to come up and visit us locally. We're going to be meeting at, um, this is going to be dated, so the, the location may change, but um, for the initial meetings anyways, we're going to start a Wednesday night Bible study, and all the information is on our website, so please check that out. If you live in Minnesota, you've got to come out and meet us in person so that we can do uh, Bible studies in person. You know what? It's amazing when you, when you sit down and fellowship in person. God, God says where two or three or more are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. So it, it, it takes the first step in getting involved is to try to get local Bible study groups together. And um, that'll be your you know, the brains of your operation, if you would, where you can, where people, you can get um, educated in God's word. You can share the truth with others, show them what scriptures apply where, and then activate people to go out in the community. You know, if somebody wants to run for mayor, have them run for mayor. Uh, somebody wants to be on city council, the school board, you name it. We need Christians in those positions of power. Liberal activists love taking control, love taking power, but, uh, you know, conservative Christians, we oftentimes, we don't seek power and control. So we kind of neglect those things, but liberals crave it. They want it. And we've got to stop them from having it. All right? Anyways, verse 2 of Zechariah chapter 10. For the idols have spoken vanity and, div and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd, no leader. And as I said before, you know, you look at America, we've been led by a corrupt establishment, a blind establishment, an establishment that does not care for the sheep, but rather care to line their own pockets. And that doesn't just apply to the politicians, that applies to a lot of our churches today. It's sad that people week in and week out give their tithes and offerings to churches that do not teach the word of God. Wasted money. Totally wasted. A true shepherd of God, a true shepherd of God will teach God's word line by line and arm the people with the truth. You know, when I go into many of these churches, it's the same thing. Lots of songs, lots of worship, and I'm not knocking on that alone. If that's that's fine. But then you get to the message, it's supposed to be a sermon, and the pastor walks around with his hands in his pockets, telling stories that, are, that you're supposed to relate to, so you can just go home and feel good for the day. And most people don't even have their Bible with them to church. Instead, a lot of them are looking at, uh, you know, a pamphlet, the church uh, itinerary or bulletin for the week. 
and they never were able to get into the word. They just heard the, maybe heard the pastor preach a few verses here and there, but they don't, they don't, they're not getting any further in their own understanding and in their own ability to handle the word of God for themselves. We don't need any more Christians that don't know how to handle the word of God for themselves. We need active Christians who can take the scriptures and apply them in life, to their personal life, to their family life, to their community, to their county, to their state, and to their nation. All right, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit more as time goes on as well, but um, it's sad, it's sad. I mean, I've been uh, doing a lot of research here lately on churches in my town, um, figuring out what they're teaching. And it, 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 it's almost depressing. You know, we don't have a lo big local church building, but then I see others that do. And it makes me sad because I'm thinking, what a waste of resources. I mean, Christian Overcomers uh, has a very minimal budget. And we're trying to teach the Word of God. While... These other churches that are just scratching people's backs and tickling their ears. They've got, you know, money going, uh, you know, uh, money coming out of the seams over there with the fancy buildings. And, and, and it's just, it's a waste. It's a total waste. Um, and uh, we hope to do something about it. We want, we want to grow a local congregation here so that we have a team. Now, I'm saying this for all of you people who are local here. We want to build a team of people who, who, who want to serve the people. A team of people who want to get the word of God out to the people to change their lives, to change their communities, and to change our nation. To take America back. No more of this, uh, you know, panty waist Christianity. But warrior Christianity. So I'm pleading with you. If you live in Minnesota, come on out. Let's build our team. Let's get an organization together, uh, a local church, if you would. We've been primarily online since our existence, but I decided that uh, we're probably going to we're, we're going to try and change that. If it be God's will, and He sends us the right people that want to that want to serve. All right. So if you're tired of panty waist Christianity. Tickle your Christianity, storytelling Christianity, all this fluffy, fluffy duff Christianity, then come and join us. Support us and help us grow so that we can take the fight to the enemy and pray for us. All right? And if you got a church near you that does the right thing and they teach the church line by uh, teach the Bible line by line, and they're teaching people to be active then be sure to support that church. All right? All right, so here we go. So I'm going to talk about this, you know, false dreams and vanity. You know, I've gone online and checked out some, uh, a lot of YouTube videos in my time here. And um, I've seen a lot of people always claiming to have some dreams. God gave me a dream today. And a lot of times... They're telling those dreams merely to try to get people excited, uh, to try to make them think that they're some kind of an authority hearing from God. And, and, when you, and, and most of those, when you look at it, act, their main point is to try to get you somehow to give you, to give them your money. And it, it, it's sad. I mean, that's what... Well, we're going to get into that another time. We're going to get into that more in depth. But the people, the reason why they went astray is they had idols, these little personal household idols, these things that they clung on to. That's what these idols were. They, they uh, um, you know, think about the vanity that we're here in our, hearing in our churches today and um, the diviners telling lies and people telling false dreams. God says they didn't have any shepherds. No line-by-line -line Bible teachers to guide them in the green pastures of the kingdom of God. And that's, uh, that's what we want to change. Verse 3, My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. 
The goats are another uh, symbol of leader, leaders or leadership. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as the goodly horse in battle. You know, during the time of Christ, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious establishment, if you would, they were the ones in charge. They were supposedly the shepherds. And when Jesus came, he rebuked them handed the kingdom over to the church, to the 12 apostles who grew the church, a new kingdom. And, um, and that, that uh, gospel kingdom, if you would, started out primarily with the tribe of Judah. I can't remember if it was actually even for a, a certain amount of years. I'd have to go back into the book of Acts. But it started out with the, with the tribe of Judah. And I believe this prophecy is referring to that, that the, the, the initial church began with the tribe of Judah. All right. Um, <clears throat> verse 4, out of him, out of Judah came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor, or it should be leader, strong leader, together. You know, Judah was a blessed tribe. That's the tribe that primarily returned here during the time of Zechariah uh, to restore um, the land, the city of Jerusalem, as well as to rebuild the temple, to restore both the national and the religious life of Israel. And so Judah was a blessed tribe. It was the tribe, um, and in fact, it's actually referring to the, these, the corner came out of him, the nail. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are uh, other terms used that represent the Messiah. So the very Messiah would come out of this tribe of Judah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 5, And they shall be as mighty men, which shall tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight, because the Lord is with them, and the riders on the horses shall be confounded. My friends, I believe this is referring to the church. Referring to the, the, the Christian soldiers. You know, today, we've got a lot of wimps in, the, in our Christian pulpits. I mean, we've got a lot of sally pantses in our churches. I'm gonna, when I look at some of these pastors, I'm like, they don't even, they, they, they look like, uh, you know, like there's some metrosexual or something. That looks like they're, they're, they're blending into society so much they're losing their manhood. Our churches need more real men shepherding their flocks. Not a bunch of panty waist, tight jeans wearing, effeminate looking men. We need men of God whom other young men can follow and be men. And you know what? That's what this verse is talking about. It's talking about Christians being warriors. Not pacifists. And war means you go and you take something away from the enemy. We've got to have that mentality. And how do we do it today? We do it with the word of God. We do it by telling the truth. We go after Satan's strongholds. The places in our community, those positions of power even. That Satan has taken over and we expose them with the truth. And we defeat them. We go again. We take ground. We don't give ground. And panty waist preachers and pastors that do not have a warrior mentality for God's kingdom but just think Jesus was some hippie pacifist, they're not going to get the job done. As God says here, he's going to say, this is, this, is, this, this is intertwined with the gospel. This prophecy right here in verse 5 has to do with how the gospel would be spread by courageous Christians. Not this modern, hip and cool type church, you know, seeker-friendly churches. Again, where, where the pastor's up there wearing tight girl-like jeans and, 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 and you know, loafers or flip-flops or whatever they wear. It's like they're all the same. 
The rock and roll churches, man. Everybody come in. Cool. We're hip and cool. Got the coffee shop over there. Um, you know, everybody just uh, worship the Lord today and feel good and be a good person and be loving. No, God says he needs warriors. And he said that they were going to be as mighty men, these people that brought forth the gospel, which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them. I hear a lot of pastors today say, oh, we don't get involved in politics and things like that. Well, you just surrendered ground to the enemy. All right, I'm not going to get into that, that discussion here today. But um, God's looking for warriors. How about you? Are you a warrior? Or are you following a pacifist, wimpy, limp-wristed preacher? I've had enough of those. It's time that that stops, my friend. You know, I, I actually wrote a little bit about this here um, on Facebook. And I think I'm going to read through it real quick. We've gone about 30 minutes, so we got time. On Facebook, I wrote uh, related to this, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ revolutionized the world with his teachings. This change was not the result of Christians conforming to pagan culture, like we see in the modern church today, i.e. the seeker-friendly, hip and cool type churches. Christians were the counterculture. They sought to overthrow all forms of paganism along with its demonic strangleholds everywhere they went. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. These Christians were true disciples, true warriors, nonconformists. All right? That's how Christianity spread. They didn't, it didn't spread by saying, let's just blend in with the culture. Let's be hip and cool so we can get people to join our church. All right? Um, I wrote some other things here. And I'm not going to go into that too much in depth. I'm going to save these here. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, as far as war goes, some people will say, I had some slides I was going to read, but I don't want to bog you down with too many, too many uh, slides. When you're saved, the, the whole, if you remember the story of when the Israelites left Egypt all the way until they entered the promised land, that gives the whole plan of salvation to a Christian growth, to becoming a warrior. Let me explain. The free gift of grace was given to the Israelites when God delivered them from Egypt. Remember, they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. Well, that's the equivalent to believing in Christ. Once you believe in Christ, you're saved from Egypt. You're saved from sin. After that, the Israelites were to be tested in the wilderness. They were to be test, uh, to test their loyalty was going to be tested, their strength, their endurance, and many of them failed. And one of the most notable failures was when the Israelites were too afraid to go in and conquer the promised land. They were too afraid to go to war. Now back then it was physical. Today it's spiritual. And so it can be physical at some times too if your nation calls you for war. But anyways. So after being saved, they had to be tested. Then they had to go and conquer the promised land. They had to take dominion. They had to defeat the pagans. Well, it's the same today. A lot of Christians are told all you have to do is believe and be saved. Well, guess what? That's only step one. That's only... That's only just leaving Egypt, if you would. That's only uh, crossing over the Red Sea. Why aren't churches teaching their congregations what to do after they're saved? That is to say, what's expected of them now that they're in the wilderness of testing? Why are they neglecting to tell them that they're supposed to now be a warrior going forth and attacking the strongholds of Satan in their life, in their families, uh, in their family, in their community, and in their nation. Why? And that's what we're going to be talking about a lot. Believe and be saved is only step number one. 
Most churches across America leave out all the rest of our duties. And they, and they try to say the rest of those duties, that's not the gospel. Jesus doesn't want us to be involved in our community and in politics and stuff. We just come to church and feel good. And we just know we're going to heaven. It's just believe and have faith and we're saved. Yeah, that's, that you get saved by your faith. But now you got to be baptized, be born again, and, and, and mature into a warrior. A Christian overcomer. All right. Anyways, I better get reading, otherwise we're not going to finish this. And I will strengthen, verse 6, and I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I, the Lord, am their God, and will hear them. So everybody was, was gathered together at the hearing of the gospel. All of God's people had, had the opportunity, as well as the nations, to come into one body, that is the body of Christ. Excuse me. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man. No, it didn't say wimpy man. It says they of Ephraim like a mighty man. This is referring to the, the gospel era. This is referring to now. They of Ephraim, the spreaders of the gospel, shall be like mighty men, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad, and their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. In other words, God was saying, basically, it's like he's whistling for them. Okay, not hissing like a snake, okay? That his translation is probably a, a pretty bad one there. But um, he's going to whistle for them. Gather them together. Are you hearing God's call? That's what the gospel does. It gathers God's people. When you, when, when you got a line-by-line -line Bible teacher saying, Hear the word of the Lord. That's all God calls. His people together. Through his word. Not stories of man, not your pastor walking around with his hands in his pocket telling stories like he's some cool guy. Those days, we've got to put an end to those days. No more seeker-friendly, hip and cool type churches anymore. We need Bible teaching churches. And it's time if you're in one of those to leave it and join and support a true Bible teaching church. Otherwise, we're not going to have any Bible teaching churches in America. And if you, if you don't have the opportunity to support one, well, figure out a way to start one in your community if you have to. Or, um, or start a Bible study group or something. Verse 9, I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in the far countries and they shall live with their children and turn again. I cannot help but remember of like the, the parable of the sower where Jesus talked about how he was sowing his children in the world and they were going to bring others into that kingdom as well. All right, sometimes we are scattered, you know, scattered for a reason. Uh, but you are planted where you belong. That's why I say if you, you're planted in, in a state, in a town, in a city, and if God wants you there, you're supposed to do something there. You're supposed to grow there, produce fruit there. All right? We can't just fix, try to fix America on the national level all the time. It's got to start in the, in our, with ourselves, with our families, in our communities, counties, and state. And country. All right, then, then eventually country. I will bring them again out of the land of Egypt. That was a place of bondage. They were slaves there. And I will gather them out of Assyria. That was the other place where they were slaves. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead, which means that it was a blessed land, fruit, uh, very fertile. And Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. All right, they're going to be, the, God's going to take them out of bondage and bring them to a place of freedom. That's what we have in Christ. And materially or physically, that's what Christians have gotten us here. The early Christians, the Christians on the Mayflower and so forth. Our forefathers came over here 
to build this country as a Christian nation. And we're living off of their blessings. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea and all the deeps of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. In other words, these pagan world kingdoms will be defeated. Who do you think, who do you think God's going to use to do that? You, my friend. You're supposed to be doing it. You're supposed to be a mighty man or a mighty woman carrying forth the gospel, carrying forth the word of God in every aspect of your life. And I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. In the name of the Lord, they're going to walk around and call themselves Christians, Christ men, or Christ women, followers of Christ. All right. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that study. I'm so happy to get back into the line by line studies. Um, we took about uh, about three weeks off or so um, because I wanted to have a little sabbatical and recharge my batteries and also have a little time to kind of refine our mission. And to listen to God and to see which direction he wants us to go. And for now, um, I think he's kind of clarified our direction some. So we're going to, we're going to, we ask that you pr uh, pray for us, pray for our ministry, pray that we can build a good team of people together, um, that we can really try to improve this ministry in, in as far as its outreach and uh, get the, just to get the word of God out to the people, to take America back. One county at a time. God bless you. If our ministry has helped you, please help support us. Uh, you can do that by sharing our videos, going to our website at christianovercomers.com. There's a link in the video description where you can make a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. Um, anyway, stay in his word every single day so that you can be a Christian overcomer.